This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Andy Ferguson and I'm pleased to be one of the pastors at Church Street Church. Let's start this morning with a little Bible quiz. Which one of these sayings is not from the Bible? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. God helps those that help themselves. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Not so easy, is it? The correct answer, the saying that is found nowhere in the Bible, is God helps those who help themselves. It's usually attributed to Benjamin Franklin, who published it in Poor Richard's Almanac. Surprised? A great many Americans are when they learn God helps those who help themselves is not in the Bible. Somehow they just assumed it had to be in here somewhere. God helps those who help themselves is a beloved tenet of American secular wisdom, but not of Christianity. It reflects the, the, the breezy optimism that with hard work anyone can make it in our society. It is a nice thought, but the real world is just a little different. The can-do optimism of Poor Richard's Almanac, expressed in that old saying, is both a help and a reason for caution. It is a help when it encourages Americans to get up each day and build a brighter world. It is a caution when it invites us to ignore the challenges and dangers all around or even within us in our desire to push ahead. In his book, The Prophetic Imagination, Walter Brueggemann suggests that Jeremiah is the clearest Old Testament model for prophetic imagination and ministry. This is what he said. He is a paradigm for those who address the numb and denying posture of people who do not want to know what they have or what their neighbors have. Jeremiah is frequently misunderstood as a doomsday spokesman of a pitiful man who had a grudge and sat around crying, but his public and personal grief was for another reason and served another purpose. Jeremiah grieves the grief of Judah because he knows what the king refuses to know. It is clear that Jeremiah did not in anger heap scorn on Judah, but rather articulated what was in fact present in their community, whether they acknowledge it or not. He articulated what the community had to deny in order to continue their self-deception. He affirmed that all that satisfied them was nothing but the eating of oneself to death. Jeremiah knew long before the others that the end was coming and that God had, a, had had enough of indifferent affluence, cynical oppression, and presumptive religion. He knew that the freedom of God had been so grossly violated that death was at the door and would not pass over. Now, sometimes the, the serious issues of the day cannot be pushed aside by our optimism and a positive outlook. Sometimes God's people have to deal with things we would prefer not to encounter. What we forget, strangely enough, is that God gives us the strength and the tools to deal with whatever comes. The great days, the long listless days, and even the day when the wolf stands at the door. When we claim God is with us, we're not declaring some sort of immunity from the problems that beset ordinary people. We are declaring our confidence that God will give us the strength and wisdom to deal with whatever we have to face. We're going to read from the prophet Jeremiah today. I hope you'll get your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter 8. As you're finding your Bible, let's listen as our parish adult choir sings for us that great hymn, Children of the Heavenly Father.
Now turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 8. We begin with verse 18. The prophet speaks, My joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick. Hark the cry of my poor people is far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have you provoked me to anger with their images and their foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of my poor people I am hurt. I mourn and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water, and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. Would you pray with me? Lord, we receive your gift of this word. Let it be for us a teacher and an ear to your, your holy word. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. We must locate Jeremiah in history if we're going to understand his message. We need to identify his time and place. The details are important. Israel was once 12 tribes who escaped from slavery in Egypt. After 40 years in the desert wilderness, Israel crossed the Jordan River to enter the Promised Land. Years passed and this loose collection of people gradually developed into a nation under King David. With David's leadership, they developed the cities and borders of a real nation. They also developed the strains of a real nation. King David was followed by his son, King Solomon, who so oppressed the people that the northern ten tribes rebelled and established their own nation. With that, the Hebrews could be found in Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Recalling our own American Civil War, it's not hard to understand how any nation might be divided this way. Anyone who reads the Bible can piece together this story as it weaves its way through the Old Testament and into the New. What is not as clear is the impact of the, the nations around the young nation of Israel. The impact of the neighboring nations cannot be ignored. Recall the map of the Holy Land. To the south of Israel lies Egypt, the same Egypt that the Israelites escaped with Moses' help. To the west is the Mediterranean Sea, to the eastern border is the Jordan River, and beyond that, the modern nation of Jordan, which includes some harsh desert. In ancient times, Assyria lay to the north of Israel. Today, Syria lies to the north, with tiny Lebanon standing in between. If you were to go north to Syria and then travel east, you would come to modern Iraq and Iran, the modern names for ancient Babylon. Not so surprising. All the neighboring nations that caused difficulties in ancient days are still the nations causing difficulties today. Now think about it. When Israel escaped slavery in Egypt, Pharaoh could not chase them beyond the Red Sea. His reach did not go very far from the borders of Egypt itself. Once in the Sinai wilderness, the Israelites were free to make their own way. When David became king, his biggest problem was the Philistines along the Mediterranean coast things were still local. When King Solomon died and the nation divided into Israel north and Judah south, Assyria to the north was becoming a world power. Eventually, Assyria invaded the north and annexed Israel for itself, leaving tiny Judah as the only remaining land of the ancient Hebrews. That was in 721 BC. Around 125 years go by. It's now around 600 BC. Judah is still the land of the Hebrews, but Assyria is beginning to lose its influence. The Egyptians from the south and the Iranians, excuse me, the Babylonians from the north are expanding their territories. Judah is caught at the center of this power struggle. Judah is too small to defend its borders from the stronger nations of Egypt and Babylon. Judah becomes the frontier between the two larger nations pushing from the south and the north. The challenge faced by the various kings of Judah is how to play these stronger neighbors against each other. Whenever one clearly becomes stronger, the king must make sure the nation is standing on the correct side. If the balance of power changes, Judah's king must be ready to change with it. This then is the situation to which Jeremiah was born and then called to prophesy. In the political arena, which we've just been outlining, Jeremiah believed that Babylon was going to rise in power and that Egypt was going to decline. 
There were plenty of others in Judah who believed that Egypt was going to rise and that Babylon was going to decline. This was no small debate. These two great powers often battled each other in that region. The victor would occupy and rule Judah. If Judah was standing with the winning side, the transition would be pretty smooth. But if Judah was standing on the losing side, then this transition would be disastrous. Nobody had the luxury of being an isolationist. These two great powers were nearby all the time. As a result, it was a time of upheaval. Lawlessness was common. Life was hard. The parallels between the ancient times and our own are pretty obvious. Egypt and Syria have been in turmoil from that time to the present, something like uh, 3,000 years. As much as we would rather not admit it, whatever happens in those nations will have an impact on us. The moat around the United States of America that protected us from problems in foreign lands has shrunk now to the size of two wide creeks. When Saudi Arabia can turn off our oil and Afghanistan can spawn a terrorist like Osama bin Laden and Palestinians can lob rockets into modern Israel, then we cannot ignore the larger world any more than the ancient Israel could ignore the bigger world beyond its borders. Too often we summarize Jeremiah's message to say, if you would just behave like good followers of God, then all our problems would go away. Be moral, worship the right way, don't talk with foreigners. We could isolate ourselves in this land God promised us and everything would be fine. But I think we have missed the message of Jeremiah. An alternative interpretation of Jeremiah calls for a nation run on religious principles. Nations around the world which follow this approach replace the oppression of political doctrine with the oppression of religious doctrine. This too misses the message of Jeremiah the prophet. I hear instead a prophet who is calling his people to be true to themselves by being true to the God who called them out of slavery to become a distinct people. They could not be true to themselves and to their God by presenting themselves to the Egyptians and then the Babylonians as whatever they thought the victor was looking for on any particular day. The God we worship shapes our character. If we worship any old God or all of them, then we lose sight of who we are and who our God calls us to be. When we're playing power games with the world powers, then the powerless do not matter. Exploitation becomes the norm and occasional act of human kindness become the feel-good stories on the evening news. When our faith follows any God any time, then the various conflicting sexual and family mores of each one will also be followed. As ancient Israel demonstrated, when a great injustice is about to be unleashed on all of us, then daily injustice among ourselves makes no difference. When you're about to lose your nation and maybe your life, then taking a little something extra from your neighbor is no big deal. Jeremiah would say it is a big deal that we are true to what God has called us to be, faithful to the God who has been faithful to us just in all our dealings with our neighbors, whether at the corner market or on the world market, cherishing and honoring the families we establish, the same families that sustain us daily, confident in our beliefs, that we are free to be tolerant of those who are different from ourselves. Being true to ourselves and our God, we are better able to address the great powers and the great situations that challenge us daily. So far, we have talked about who we should be as we deal with one another and our God. But the passage we read this morning from Jeremiah now tells us something about who God is. For too long, we have read Jeremiah as delivering God's disapproval and judgment on Israel, and he does. But Jeremiah tells us more than God's disapproval and judgment. We have imagined the God of Jeremiah as standing in disapproval over broken Israel, ready to unleash punishment. But Jeremiah reveals a picture of God that is far deeper and richer than that picture. What Jeremiah shows us is the heart of the God who seeks us. Listen, is this Jeremiah who speaks, or is it God who speaks through him? My joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick. Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. 
God is the God of the tender heart, the God who weeps at the brokenness of his people. It makes a difference that we understand God's tenderness toward us and toward this nation. A preacher went to a church where he found much to disapprove. He called on the people out on their sinfulness, their shortcuts, and plain immorality. He told them about the punishment that was waiting for people who lived that way. In the first three months as pastor, he never complimented the people on a single point. It was not long before the congregation got tired of that treatment. A delegation went to the bishop, and soon enough, that preacher was gone. A different pastor was sent. He called the people out on their sinfulness, their shortcuts, and plain immorality. In the first three months as pastor, he never complimented the people on a single point either. He told them about the punishment that was waiting for people that lived that way. This went on for a full year. Of course, the preacher knew what had happened to his predecessor, and he grew curious. At the end of the first year, his curiosity getting the best of him, he asked some of the leaders of the church, when the other preacher was here, he told you all you were doing wrong. You hated him, and he did not last but three months. I came, I've also told you all that you were doing wrong. But a year has gone by, and you seem happy to see me coming. What's the difference? Well, preacher, began one of the church leaders. That other preacher told us, just like you do. But the difference is that he seemed to enjoy it. But with you, it breaks your heart. God calls us to live up to the greatness that God offers us. And when we fail and we fall short, it breaks God's heart. Lewis Stolman, in an article in Interpretation Journal, described our Jeremiah world this way. Cities in crisis, schools in disarray. A burgeoning national debt that threatens future generations and whittles away at already dwindling funds for basic human services. Nations using military solutions because they have no alternatives. New technologies that result in alienation and de dehumanization. Consumerist values that anesthetize us to our true selves. Immigration legislation rooted in xenophobia and garbed in evangelical piety. Global economic policies that breed resentment, rage, and abject despair rapid depletion of non-replaceable natural and cultural resources, limited access to basic health care, adequate food and safe water among the world's most vulnerable communities, mounting indifference to savage acts of violence, including torture and the systemic killings of civilians, children exploited as sexual commodities. It's quite a list. And God is among us, brokenhearted at the suffering God sees. The word of the prophet calls God's people to be true to ourselves by being true to the God who called us out of slavery to become a distinct people. We cannot be true to ourselves and to our God by presenting ourselves to the world as whatever our enemies are looking for on any given day. The God we worship shapes our character, standing in the presence of God. We deal with the nations with integrity, strength, and charity. As Jeremiah said in chapter 46, verse 27, But as for you, have no fear, my servant Jacob, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, for I am going to save you from far away and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and no one shall make him afraid. Well, let's listen now. As our parish youth choir sings for us, this time they will be singing I want Jesus to walk with me.
As we come to the close of our time this morning, I want to extend an invitation to join us at Church Street United Methodist Church for Sunday worship. Our services are at 8.30 and 11 a.m. in the nave. It is a beautiful place where the music just fills the space and it is, it is a beautiful place. I invite you to come and join us for Sunday worship. Also, I want to invite you on Wednesday, if you happen to be uptown at noon, to step into the noonday worship service and to be a part of communion as we gather there at the Lord's table. Finally, not this Sunday today, but next Sunday on the 29th, we're going to be offering a blessing of the animals and I want to invite you, whether you're a part of the Church Street community or not, to come bring the, the, the pets that fill your home and your life so that together we might offer God's blessing for these animals as they too are a part of our family lives. It will be outside in the chapel, three o'clock in the afternoon. I invite you to come as we share that time together. Finally, I'm Andy Ferguson, pastor at Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I thank you for letting me share this devotional time with you in your home. And now as I go, my wish for you is that you might live each day like out of the corner of your eye. You've just caught sight of God and realize that God is headed your way. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice.